I retired as a professor of biology, having been teaching about plants for 30 years. And in retirement, we traveled. And because my husband is an acupuncturist, now retired, we especially went to Asia and, and especially looked at Chinese art all over the world, in collections all over the world. I have to say that the Louvre was a disappointment <laughs> because there's no Chinese art in the Louvre. <laughs> and, uh, and for me, looking at the art is looking at the plants. I, from my background, I can't resist looking for the plants in the art. So I'm honored today to represent the Asian Art Association in this In Bloom exhibit this summer, talking about the lotus and other plants in Asian art. Now the word lotus in English turns out to cover a number of plants. The one that I'll call the sacred lotus is the one I'm mostly going to be talking about, but a little later I'll talk about the Egyptian lotus and the lotus tree since the art that, that's in the display on the fifth floor includes those other meanings, other lotus plants. But the one that's throughout Asian art that's really important in Asian art is lotus, which I could call the Asian lotus, I could call it the sacred lotus. It's Nelumbo nucifera in the lotus family, the Nelumbonaceae. And from a botanical point of view or historical point of view, it's a very interesting plant. There's only one genus of, of plant and two species in the Nelumbonaceae, just the Asian lotus and the American lotus. And yet, and that's because it's very distinctive. This pink flower that sticks up above the water the great big leaves, these leaves can be a, a meter across if it's in a good condition. Those great big leaves will also stick up above the water in, in the round leaf, will catch water and, and, and absorb it from the leaf. And in particular, you can rec rep recognize the sacred lotus by these very distinctive pods. You've probably seen them in dried arrangements and never thought that was a a sacred lotus pod, but that's what they are. And they're so distinctive that they find them in the fossil record going way back, what, in the, into the age of dinosaurs, into the, into the upper Cretaceous, there are fossils of recognizable pods of lotus. So they would call it a living fossil. It still looks like it looked back when there were dinosaurs walking the earth. At that time, it was spread all over the world. The, the fossil I'm talking about was from Argentina, but there are no longer any native lo lotus in Argentina. The world changed, it dried out, and the lotuses shrank down, and lots of its cousins and uncles died. <coughs> so that there are just these two species left. One in the forests of North, in the lakes and ponds of the forests of North America, and the, of Eastern North America, not getting this far west. And the other, in Asia, the sacred lotus. This one that I want to talk about. <coughs> we don't know the lotus very well here in, here in Colorado because we don't have a lot of, of ponds because we're so dry. It's an aquatic plant. It grows in the water. And it's a rooted aquatic, meaning that the, that the stems have to go down and reach the mud. But really the reason we don't see the Asian lotus very much is because it can't take much frost. It, the roots, if they should freeze, will die. The seeds, if they are frozen, will die. Now, as an aquatic, it can take some frost because, of course, lakes freeze from the top. So if that root is safe down there in the mud, even if, the, if there's ice across the pond, it'll survive. But it's a rooted plant. So the water can't get too deep before it's too deep for lotus to grow in. And we have some really cold winters where shallow ponds freeze. And then, and then it doesn't, lotus doesn't grow in moving water. Moving water doesn't freeze as fast as still water, but the lotus wants, won't grow in really fast moving water. It wants nearly still water or still water. 
So for those reasons, you don't find lotus very far north into cold, cold temperatures. That said, people have been growing lotus for a very long time, and you can plant it in your northern garden, or you can put the rhizomes out. This picture is from the Denver Botanic Garden last, last summer. This is, this is lotus. They have them in pots. They take them in in the winter, put them out in the spring. <laughs> but if you live in India, if you live in Southeast Asia, Southern China, Southern Japan, you can just toss the lotus seeds out into standing water or a soggy place, and lo, they will come up and grow. And one of the things that people really like about lotus is under good conditions, it grows very fast. So if you imagine a, the start of the monsoons in India, where everything has gotten very dry and parched, and the low spots don't have any plants in them, it rains, the pond fills up, and almost miraculously, the rhizomes of the lotus come out, they come up, it grows very fast, and it fills that area before you really even realized that it was a wet spot again, because the, the rhizomes are very, the roots in the ground. Rhizome is an underground stem, and that's really <coughs> what carries lotus through different years. The rhizomes in, in the mud are very tolerant of being dried out, just add water and you'll find plants again. But the other aspect that makes this attractive to Asians is it's edible. Lotus, sacred lotus is edible. The rhizomes I was talking about, those stems, are what we call the lotus root, and you, you recognize the distinctive holes? It's, it, it's actually a stem. It gets called a root because you dig it up out of the mud or underground. But those are edible and a major part of, of diet. But the, and the seeds are edible. Cook the seeds or pickle them or treat them a number of different ways and you can eat the seeds. But actually, if you're pressed, that whole thing is edible. That may not be terrifically delicious, but it's nutritious and, and you can eat it. So the buds, the fruits, the, the flowers, uh, a nice plant. Now the botanist in me can't resist telling you, even though this has not got a very strong art relationship, that the lotus holds the record for seeds that have lasted the longest and then still germinated, have been alive. The, that's, so that's the pod there, and the seeds are little hard brown uh, things. And there's a, a lotus seed that they could age because they did radioactive radiocarbon dating on the outside of the seed. And that particular seed was 1,300 years old. It's from 700 AD. They put it in water, they gave it sunlight, and the seedling came out and it grew. <laughs> that's absolutely the record for the oldest seed that we know that's ever come up. There was another one that was 1,000 years old because there's a pond in northern China that people used for years to grow lotus, and then there was an earthquake and the river shifted about 400 years ago, so they haven't been messing with it. They've been doing other things because it's no longer a lake. And people keep digging old, old seeds out of there and germinating them to see how they'll do. I should add, most seeds last maybe five years. Okay. We get very excited as botanists when we find a weed seed that's maybe 100, that's 100 years old. There are a few weeds that will last 100 years. Lotus, documented at 1,000 years and more. And the biologists, of course, are fascinated how in that seed is a live embryo that's going to be breathing and doing a little bit of metabolism day after day or it would die. There's something very special about this plant biologically. But of course, the reason most people grow lotus is for the beautiful flower. Here we have this sea of leaves emerging from the lake, and the lotus shoots the leaf, its, its flower bud up till it's higher than that, and then it opens. It has a lovely scent, 
attracts insects, is pollinated, and in about three days is through and develops its seeds. People have been growing lotus documentably back about 5,000 years. Uh, certainly they've been growing them domesticated in China for 3,000 years. So you don't have to have, all my pictures show this, this sort of a lotus flower, but they can be white, they can be pink, they can be intensely pink over the, what you would call it red, they can be pale yellow. Lots of different beautiful flowers. And they grow, if you have still or not very moving water in India or South China, it's going to be mucky stuff and it'll smell as bad as that looks. Mm -hmm. So we have this image going back two and a half thousand years to Buddha. As a lotus flower is born in water, grows in water, and rises out of water to stand above it unsoiled. So I, born in the world, raised in the world, having overcome the world, live unsoiled by the world. This is a powerful image. It applied, Buddha applied it to himself, but it also applies to the rest of us, that we too could rise above the muck of everyday life and be as beautiful as the lotus flower. And in addition, therefore, it's an image of purity, it's an image of enlightenment. And so it's an image that's been cherished by the Buddhists, used by the Buddhists multiple ways, multiple times, ever since the light. Buddha made these kinds of statements. The image per pervades Buddhism. This is a big Buddhist temple that we saw on the tour with the Asian Art Association to China in, in 2013. It's very large, it, it was just finished. It's in, in mainland China, just north of Shanghai. The Buddha in the background, we were told, is the largest standing Buddha in the world. This is a lotus bud. And with the latest in technology, the bud turns, the petals open, mist is released, and you can see the infant Buddha inside the bud. Okay, there is, there is Buddha coming in. And that is a dramatic modern adaptation of a very old set of images in, in Buddhism. So as, as you look at images of Buddhism, they often include a lotus. The throne that this Buddha from, our, from the collection, this is my very bad picture, um, is sitting on, is a lotus flower. And often there are other lotuses in it, although in this case I think those are um, not actual portrayals of, of the flower, but I did want to draw your attention to the fact that the position the Buddha is sitting in is called the lotus. The more you look and listen for lotus in, uh, in Buddhism, the more references you find to it. <coughs> but it doesn't have to be Buddhism. The lotus is a very common visible plant across Asia, and the Hindus use this image richly too. The lotus is a symbol of both the major gods, Shiva and Brahma. Brahma came into the world on a lotus flower out of the navel of Vishnu. This image of Vishnu, whoops, features a lotus coming up in his hand. And you will see that he's standing on a lotus throne as are the <coughs> goddesses beside him. Hindu imagery is rich, rich in lotus images. Lakshmi, wife of Shiva, goddess of wealth, goddess of love, goddess of fortune, comes into the world on a, on a lotus flower. The lotus is her symbol. 
And as you can see in this picture, she is sitting on lotuses, holding lotuses, surrounded by lotuses. The imagery is very strong because that's her image. And there are other gods and goddesses among the Hindus who often hold lotus to make the image of purity or of enlightenment, but also um, as part of their, their symbology. So ancient Asian art, Asian art actually for the two, last 2,500 years is rich in images of lotus because not only do the Buddhists use it as, as an important symbol, not only do the Hindus use it as an important symbol, it's an important symbol to the Taoists, it's important in symbol to the Jains, it's an important symbol in Shintoism, and there are probably other major religions in, in Asia and Southeast Asia that, that use it. And I don't think there's any similar plant in Western art with that kind of ubiquity that has is shown across cultures, across languages, across space, the way the lotus is in Asia. So in terms of looking for plants in Asian art, watch for the lotus. It's, it's wonderful. And it isn't always what you're going to see, the, the flower. The, the bud has meanings, and so different individuals, different um, pieces of art will show you a lotus bud instead of a lotus flower. This is the pod, the fruit, actually. And the fruit will have perhaps all the symbolism of, of the plant as a whole, but it's a fruit, it's full of seeds. We add fertility as one of the um, images we might, you might get out of looking at these pods and thinking about fruit. And the leaves are distinctive. So you can have things like this beautiful uh, women's vest that's in the collection that has um, well, well drawn out examples of leaves of lotus in addition to, of course, lots of pictures of, of, of the flowers there. There are a lot of other kinds of, say, Buddhist imagery that's, that's across the art of, of Asia. The Bodhi tree was a fig tree. Um, this is, my picture is not necessarily the right fig tree, under which Buddha re received enlightenment. So often you'll see images of Bodhi trees uh, or, but that's a tropical tree. It can't take any kind of frost and to get that big, you have to be absolutely frost free because the frost in 10 years or 15 years would have killed it. So people in northern areas won't have seen actual Bodhi trees. They might be painting or drawing something that looks like a tree that they think looks like the Bodhi tree. I put the Buddha's, Buddha's hand citron in because this is a mute, mutant citron. Citron is one of the oldest of the citrus fruits. It looks loosely like a grapefruit, a small grapefruit. It's very bitter. People don't actually eat them raw. But they've been growing them and enjoying the flowers of the, of the citron tree, enjoying the smell of citron for a very long time. And this mutant that looks like a claw c goes back to probably the uh, second century AD, about 1800 years at least, because it's documented that by. And the Buddhists saw it as a hand in prayer. Okay, if, if you imagine it like this. Okay. So it's the Buddha's hand and it's a, a religious symbol, it's an image that they very much like. It smells good because it's a citron. And so you, you, you see it in this kind of context where they've embroidered it on the robe. And if you didn't know, and in both of these cases, these are plants that we don't have here, so you don't, have a, don't normally see um, big fig trees around here or Buddha's hand citrons. And so these are images of Asia that you'll have to um, learn to recognize because they're not familiar to us. That said, 
this particular Buddha's hand citron came from Whole Foods in Fort Collins. So keep your eyes open, you might see Buddha's hand citrons in northern Colorado. To transition to talk about other plants a little bit, I quickly come up against the fact that each country is, each part of Asia is different and in most cases diverse within itself. China has more plants than North America. There, there are probably 30,000 native plants in, in China and 20,000 in North America and it's not that much bigger. But they don't use those in the art. They have a tendency to pick a few and do the art symbolically and engage them in some particular way. The Chinese and probably many other cultures that are agriculture and follow the seasons care a lot about what season it is. And so for example, they use cherry blossom as an invocation of spring. Orchid tells you that the painting is done in summer. It's about summer. Chrysanthemum represents fall and pine for winter. So often they're using the plants for some sort, to give you some message that's beyond just the plant itself. If it's got chrysanthemum flowering in it, we wouldn't in fact know it's a fall plant because that's when chrysanthemums flower, but the painter's telling you that. It's, it's not casual. Then of course there are all sorts of historical stories. The love of the peony as a, as a big, beautiful, and erotic sort of plant. Bamboo representing strong strength in the face of adversity, bend with the wind, don't break. Those kinds of images. And the Chinese in particular like visual puns. So if they can use a, a plant that gives you a pun, they'll do that. I. The puns are, of course, in Chinese, so it's difficult for me to tell them. So, so let me make an example for you and say, if I said, if I gave you a bunch of grapes and a chrysanthemum, you could, in English, pun on that as grape mum, okay? This is, this is a Mother's Day gift for grape mum, all right? The Chinese do that a lot. And the puns are mostly almost that bad. They're not really accurate, but everybody knows them. So you, so you get so that some of these plants are in here in a traditional fashion because not only are you saying something about the season, but you're also giving them um, a pun that if you just read off the names of the plants, you say something, you say two things. You say the names of the plants and you say, you're a great mum. <laughs> Japan shares lots of the same plants and temperatures with China, but like, and, and I should emphasize, like China, it's very diverse from north to south. But the history is different, and the language, and so the plants go over with, with changes. So often, it's, my lo list looks very similar, uh, but but there are strong differences in what you would, would see or how you would interpret those plants. Partly, some of them are things like the chrysanthemum in a stylized fashion is on the royal coat of arms. That's totally different from in China. The iris is not a plant that the Chinese use very much, but is rich in, in the um, history and folklore and stories in, in Japan, so they use it a lot. And so there are big differences. If you move somewhere else, like India, the climate's different, the history's different, the dominant religions are different, and you get a very different set of plants that tend to show up in the art. And I should, of course, emphasize that North India and South India have very different plants, traditions, history, and so that people on one end might not recognize the traditional plants of another. Um, I can go on and do this for sort of every culture in Asia. Dif slight differences in plants, slight differences in culture, big differences in some plants, big differences in other kinds of the culture. The Mughals were a Muslim group that were a dynasty in, in Northwest India in the 1500s and 1600s. So they brought with them Muslim traditions in their plants and their paintings would be called 
West Asian, if you take an Asian point of view and you look at what we call the Middle East, that's West Asia, and it's got a bunch of distinctive desert plants. Tulips are native there, poppies are native there, whole, whole different set of plants that go with a, a Muslim tradition and with, with, with deserts. So you get a very different set of traditional Asian art, plants in the art. As soon as I come up into the last 500 years with the Europeans, there's European contact. And so traditional art is going to change, partly because they brought new ideas. And painters and artists all over the world, of course, are always eager to try new things and see what happens. And partly because they became a market almost immediately. And there were all sorts of things that they could make that the Europeans would buy. And if you're painting for Europeans, you don't need to put the traditional things in. You don't need the traditional colors. You can do combinations and permutations that have nothing to do with your personal tradition. You're just having, having a good time um, with it, which, which means that it gets much more interesting and much more diverse. A limited number of flowers, for example, in, in old Asian, old Chinese art become all kinds of diversity, as you see here, as you come up into the Ming and the Qing when there has been European contact and then export of things to the Europeans. So for all those reasons, the last four or five hundred years, four or five hundred, no, nah, still more much, three or four hundred years in Asian art is going to be very much more much less simple to understand because there's all kinds of new influences. And by the time you reach the 21st century, mm -hmm. this is from an art display that was in Beijing when we were there in 2003, you get landscapes like that where perhaps a keen eye could see the Chinese traditions, but I would, I would look first to the international art community to ask why, why does this painting look this way? So in the 21st century, it's, it's a whole world of art. I should end because, the, as I'm getting to the end, that up in the fifth floor where they pulled a bunch of, of, flower, of pieces of art into the lotus display, there are pieces that represent Egyptian lotus which is not the same as the sacred lotus Nalumbo. I don't have to keep saying Nalumbo because the English word is the same. The sacred white lotus and the blue lotus are sacred from Egypt, and they're water lilies, not, not Nalumbo. So the leaves, of the leaves sit on the surface of the water. They don't rise above the surface of the water. The flower floats on the water. It doesn't rise up. And it doesn't have that distinctive pod. However, Egyptian lotuses were traded from Egypt going east probably 2,000 or more years ago. So you can find images of Egyptian lotus in old Chinese art, in old, in old Japanese art. They went all across Asia very early. The reverse happened as well, too. The Nilumbo, the sacred lotus, is certainly recorded in Egyptian art from 3,000 years ago. In fact, it may be native somewhere in the, in the Middle East, in West Asia, Af Iran, Afghanistan, because it's a very important image in Mesopotamia, and the Mesopotamians use Nilumbo, the sacred lotus, for a fertility goddess's symbol and as the scepter, as their royal scepter was a lotus bud. So they knew that plant too. So you can find images of sacred lotus, Nilumbo, among early Egyptian art, and you can find images of the blue and the white sacred lotus, which are water lilies in Chinese and as far as far east as Japan from very long ago. But but the Egyptians liked water lilies a little bit better than they liked the sacred lotus and the lumbo. And Asia as a whole certainly prefers the uh, sacred lotus. The final lotus is the lotus eaters. This is, yeah, we'll, we'll say this is West Asia. This is a Greek tradition. And 
in the Odyssey, in the Odyssey, Odysseus is going, trying to go home from the Trojan War, and he gets blown way off course, and then he has all kinds of fantastic adventures. And one of his adventures goes like this. We reach the land of the lotus eaters, who live on a food that comes from a kind of flower, which was so delicious that those, and he's referring to his crewmen, those who ate of it left off caring about home and did not even want to go back and say what had happened to them. <laughs> Odysseus was a determined sort of guy. He went ashore with two of his, with his crewmates that hadn't, had to, hadn't tried this stuff, and he dragged these guys, kicking and screaming, onto the ship and sailed away. He doesn't say what that plant is. Herodotus, writing about 408 BC, a book which is kind of a travelogue of, of the area of ground Greece at that time, also talks about lotus eaters. And he says it's a tree, and they eat the fruits of it. And nobody knows what it really is. The jujube, which is a, there's a jujube for this Asian, and this is a Middle Eastern one. And the, um, the candy from music movie theaters is apparently named after it. I imagine it doesn't have any of that in it anymore. Um, is a very popular, tasty fruit of the Middle East. And people will describe it as, oh, yes, of course you'd linger and not leave if you could still eat another one. <laughs> but, but there's a date plum which is also a tasty fruit found in that area, related to persimmons, but much, much sweeter than the persimmons I know, which you might also linger. You can see that in both cases, botanists called them lotus, thinking maybe that was the one, because this story goes back 2,000 years, and so everybody's read the story. They just don't know what plant it is. And then I found a, an article on plants in the Greek myths that was written just in the few, last two years, by some authors in India, and they calmly asserted that it's actually the fragrant manjack called the Indian cherry, a totally different fruit. Now, for me, none of these fit the bill because none of them is narcotic and none of them, they're just nice fruits that you can eat lots of and have like eating cherries. And that's not really enough in my world to make you miss the boat and stay there forever <laughs> and ever caring nothing about going home. So, so when you go upstairs on the fifth floor and you see the poster about the lotus eaters, remember we don't know what they were eating at all. So my bottom line here is, is look for the plants in the art. And that one of them that you can find readily all across all Asian art and is very rewarding to find is certainly the lotus. And when you do, you find things like this Qing Dynasty belt buckle, which is so exquisite. The reward for finding the, the, the plants in the art is often they're beautifully, beautifully done. So, thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Were these your notes? Yep. This, yeah, I don't know why, how I picked them up. Did you want to thank people? Yes, I wanted it to. Says, it's, not me. It says, Mary Lanius. Yes. This, the notes that she carried off with her, which, um, which were here as my uh, security blanket, were to say to thank Mary Lanius back there for her help with with, for answering my questions and making her lovely library available to me. And to, to thank Douglas Wagner, who took the good pictures from the collections, the ones with the reflections, those are mine, but the, but the nice ones were his. And to, for his help in, in getting this, thank you. I'm Kathy Keeler, traveling the world far and wide to find great plant stories and to bring them back to you because I, I'm a wandering botanist.